All right, hello and uh, welcome everybody. I'm Adam Parlberg and I'm pleased to be joining you as moderator of this week's discussion from uh, Grar's education team, the three on three at three. And uh, we're the third installment of all of that Ooh. too. So how Ooh. about that? That's cool. How about that? three. Uh, earlier installments did involve um, uh, views on the marketplace. Uh, first from uh, the buyer's agent perspective, then from the seller's agent perspective. And we're tasked today with this idea of taking a view of the market that we're going to call the big picture. Okay? The big picture. So we'll dive right into that. But first, I do want to give a quick word of thanks to Grar's Education Committee for putting this initiative forward. It's had great traction so far, and, and that's been fun to watch. Um, I, want to, I want to thank all of you who are joining in on the live stream here and all of you who will be watching it later. We appreciate your involvement that way. And then, of course, I want to thank our panelists today, and let me introduce them to each of you. Immediate, immediately to my left here is Chris Keekstra. He is not just the broker, but also the owner of Remax Premier in Hudsonville, Michigan. Yay, Hudsonville. <laughs> <laughs> to his left is Julie Rietberg. She is the association executive here for us at GRAR. And then to her left is Ingrid Nelson. And Ingrid is with Berkshire Hathaway Home Services. She manages their main office, which involves how many agents? Ingrid? Oh, it, you know, it changes, that's, as you know, but good 60 yeah, some odd age, agents. That's a, yep. a broad perspective mm -hmm. there. And notably, she's also a Michigan Realtors director currently. So panel, we are here to talk about the big picture. And I'd like to begin with some discussion on a big picture item that's affecting really so many aspects of agents' day-to-day -day lives right now. And that is our low standing inventory of homes for sale. In what ways are each of you experiencing our current inventory situation? And Chris, I'll, I'll start with you. Well, I think it's pretty obvious that when you look at the stats um, on how many months inventory there are in our area, um, it just keeps going lower and lower and lower. And it seems like every month it just gets um, less, you know, it used to be over one, now it's gonna be under one and a little lower under one. So it just keeps getting lower and lower. And then, you know, I, there's one statistic I should have looked up before I came here, but I'd like to know how many houses that compares to the last five years that have been on the market. And I think you'd be, we would be surprised that there's still a lot of houses going on the market, a lot of properties. And so it's not that um, our inventory is so low, it's that we have so many more people that want to buy them. There's a whole bunch of people in the basements of their parents' houses right now who would really like to buy something. And um, so, I think that's what I'm experiencing. I'm talking to a lot of these first time home buyers and they're saying, we can't find anything. We have multiple offers, multiple showings. Um, and then it's just frustrating for buyers when they can't find something that's in their price range. And I think price range is a big part of that. And um, lumber price is going up and um, I've heard people waiting to build right now because all of a sudden they were affordable and now they're not affordable. But as that comes down, that will help that. So. That's what I'm seeing in our area. Okay, thank you, Chris. Ingrid, I'm gonna jump over to you. Okay. Being active out in the marketplace as well, how, how do you see the current yeah, inventory and, situation? And, you know, like you know, many of us, um, I, you know, personally I represented some buyers too and experiencing very much the same frustrations that a lot of agents are and, and buyers. It's tough, it's tough for buyers right now when you rejected, you know, five, six, seven offers and you're still not getting your uh, getting the home that you a home, um, let alone your first choice of a home, so it's problematic. Um, I feel um, I feel badly for buyers. It's it's challenging. Um, what I'm also seeing and hearing from from agents, I feel badly for our buyers agents too, mm -hmm. who yeah. are out there. It's not only is it hard and trying for buyers to be rejected. But we are out there working hard, trying to write the best offers, trying to negotiate uh, for our clients, and we feel badly for them. And you know, from the buyer, the agent perspective, it's tough for them too. And I think we as agents have to um, be very conscientious of that and think, you know, okay, what can we do to take care of ourselves? 
we are professionals and we are taking care of our clients, but we also have to take care of ourselves during this and recognize you know, what's going on in the marketplace. Okay, thanks Ingrid. Yeah, I hear you, both of you saying there's a practical side of it, there's an emotional side of it. Mm -hmm. Julie, how are you viewing uh, things from your role as it pertains to the inventory environment? First, from my perspective, I look at it um, as it impacts everyone else. And I said I do the numbers every month, and I did just do the, uh, the June figures last night, and we did go from 0.5 to 0.6 months of inventory. So we actually went, we went up, we went up a tenth. Uh, we're still, we're still, but yeah. Um, but as I look at it, if you actually do those numbers, there's 1,068 properties currently on the market. Half of those are vacant land and multifamily. So wow. that leaves you with five or 600 single family homes on the market. And from my perspective, I think we have 3,500 members right now. Um, I can remember when we were saying there was one listing per agent on the market currently, and now look what, where those numbers have gone. From my perspective, my hat's off to all of you who are uh, working hard. And if you really do the math, I mean, you're commission-based, many of you, most of you, not all of you, but if you're commission-based, um, admittedly, not that I want to dwell on the negative, but you're probably earning less per hour than ever because you're working with these same buyers and writing offer mm -hmm. after offer after offer um, instead of being able to write on that first one and get that accepted and then you're done with them and you can get it to close. So um, you, are, you are working hard for those dollars today for sure. Okay, so clearly it's across the board and it's not just us here in West Michigan, it's, it's national. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that it's, uh, it's having certain effects on all of us and buyers and sellers. So here's what I want to ask you next. Have you heard of or seen any initiatives that are being put forth to help increase inventory? And if so, what are they? Hmm. Want me? Well, you want to go? Well, you want to go. I would encourage everybody to read the recent uh, uh, article on the housing shortage. Um, from the Realtor Magazine, there are some kind of interesting things that people are doing, you know, not necessarily in this market, but looking, maybe diversifying their business a little bit to get into some of that development, or even um, taking a house, looking at a house that maybe is not the highest and best use of the land, mm -hmm. and agents themselves redeveloping that and getting it uh, in the marketplace. Um, you know, that doesn't work for, for, for all of us, um, but, you know, it, part of it is, is market conditions and, um, you know, hey, we all got to do our little piece that we can do. So. Yeah, I mean, zoning issues um, limit us from what we can do. Um, having enough people to build more, to have new construction, um, we've been having a shortage of that for years now. So uh, we got to keep doing that. Lumber prices going up has been a little hindrance from some people. But we need more units and we don't just need units to transfer from investment properties to um, owner-occupied, I mean, that doesn't really, it's just going from one side to the other. We need more units. So um, we've talked about, even before this, we were talking about um, this, and you were, you were talking about maybe we can make in-law apartments in some of these houses, but we'd have to ch change zoning to do that. So there's just a lot of little things that we can do, but when it comes right down to it, to me, it's all about creating more units somehow and getting the people out of the basements. I mean, I keep saying that, but that's where a lot of people have to live. They're living in groups they would have not lived in before as far as living with parents, maybe friends living together, a group of six friends buying a, or renting a place together. That's what they're doing. They would love to buy or rent individually, but they can't do it because of either affordability or that's just not available. So. Chris, before I go to Julie on that same question, you mentioned zoning. Are you seeing anything uh, happening with zoning in your area? I have not seen any changes in our area, um, and I haven't worked at it to, you know, I guess we'd have to go to our townships and explain some of this. And I guess that's what, as members, we can start doing. I mean, um, I, think, I think that's a good point, Chris, because, you know, we subscribe to the Code of Ethics, and in the preamble of the Code of Ethics, it says we... Um, we have a social responsibility um, in order to advocate for housing and to encourage the widest and um, most diversified ownership of, of land ownership. So I think that's 
you know, maybe a small thing. I don't know how much impact it really will have, but you know, if we had 35 members who all went to their townships and municipalities and voiced our um, concerns and what we're seeing in the marketplace, you know, maybe it would have a little bit of an impact. Mm -hmm. Julie, on that note, go. if I can issue a call to action, um, the Government Affairs Committee recently created um, a four-page, we're calling it a white, a white paper on housing availability. Uh, we originally had the word affordability in there, but really wanted to focus more on the availability issue versus affordability. That, uh, we're in the process now, and that was approved by the Board of Directors. Uh, we can make it available to all of our members. Our goal right now is to identify some key people within each of the local units of government that can be uh, help us be spokespersons uh, to the to people that you know in those areas, the decision makers. Um, I mean, there are admittedly there will be some municipalities that will always have a closed door to the concept of of higher density, smaller lot sizes. Should we start building up and so we continue to think out? Um, what about upward? When when is that trend going to happen here? Um, is it time? Is this is this now the time because of inventory? So there are a number of you that we're going to hopefully tap into your connections at your local unit of government. If you're willing to help us, um, and I'm going to say this ever so carefully, you have a great reputation <laughs> in your local unit of government um, where they um, listen to you and you and you have uh, the respect of the local units. I don't I don't say that to be rude. I really don't. There are. There are some places that you um, can speak perhaps better than others because um, those of you who have gone before planning commissions or city commissions um, in the past and, and have encountered, and, and I've done so, so I know that reaction and have encountered, encountered negative reaction, um, that's, that's not a fun place to be. But hopefully this is something that we can target. Um, in addition to that, we've talked as an association. We haven't gone down this road yet, but we're kind of looking into the difficulty right now, uh, when you get a listing and you add a listing into inventory, almost always you're all also adding a buyer. So you're typically getting a seller who's selling to buy. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, we really aren't helping inventory because we're putting one on the market and we're adding a buyer to the market. So it doesn't add to the market. And you mentioned kind of the investment property thing. One of the things we're looking at is um, to try to identify those investment-owned properties. There are a lot of investors that bought big during the downturn in packages from banks, 30, 40, 50 properties at a time. Um, a lot of them are still sitting on those. And um, if our information we're receiving is correct, we should likely expect to see increases in the capital gains tax um, within the next, certainly within the next couple of years. So now might be the time for them to consider letting go of some of these properties, which would return some of that to an owner-occupied right. potential without putting another buyer in the market. So it should hopefully help the net end of it. So it's, you know, none of these, none of these ideas are going to fix things overnight, um, but hopefully all of these things will eventually combine and snowball and fix that inventory problem. Julie, it's interesting because I had the same uh, conversation with a client investor client of mine now she didn't own 50 properties but she owned few and had that conversation with her and given the market conditions and the prices and and she did decide to liquidate so cool. um, you know even just it, it just because we don't know you know these big institutional investors um, having that maybe that one-on-one -on -one conversation with the investors that we do have um, maybe encouraging them now might be a good time to sell if I were to play devil's advocate, I might take the posture of saying, you know, inventory is such a big thing. Can we really have any kind of meaningful impact with it? Or should we just kind of let the economic forces of supply and demand run their course? Um, do you think these things that you're talking about really can, can make a dent in it? Go ahead. A big dent or a little dent? I mean, it takes, I mean, if you go take a hammer on a car and make a lot of dents in it, right? You can make small dents and big dents. It all depends on, you, you need all of them, right? Analogy. You need it all together. So you got to really, um, we have a lot of members right now. And if we all did something um, to try to do what, like you said, what is what we should be doing is making home ownership affordable and available to everyone. Um, I think 
we can all, I think we, we can do stuff. But can we, is it gonna happen overnight? No. Is it gonna happen next year? No. Um, but we can, we can help a little bit. You know, when you talk about um, transferring, like you get investors to become, you know, those houses to become um, owner occupied, you still got those renters that need, now need to find somewhere else. And so we're kind of flipping, flopping people around. And, um, and so, you know, you, you have that problem. But one of the things I've been thinking about is just another idea is there's the, the difference between a taxable value and assessed value right now is that that yeah. gap is getting huge. And so there's a lot of extra tax dollars that could um, be coming into the townships and the schools and those kind of things if a lot of those properties, look at all the properties and the values that have gone up and the assessed values. If we sold all those properties right now, that'd be a lot more money in the, and so if there's anything that um, Mar can do or um, to try to say, hey, is there any incentive we can give these investors or to, you know, or people to sell right now? Um, it's not gonna help, it's not gonna help bring more inventory, but it may at least help turn some more houses and get them in different hands and maybe make affordability better, I'm not sure, but. And, and I, think, I think turning the ship, you know, it, it is like that big tanker in the middle of the, in the, middle of the ocean. You, you know, we're, here overnight, right? We're, we're, not, we're not going to change it overnight, but this is the time where you start to change the mentality of the elected officials when they see the impact it's having in their local units. If we wait for the economy to fix itself in terms of housing values and inventory, will be beyond the point of being able to have impact in that area. So now really is the time. I mean, the, it wasn't that long ago. There's a lot of, there's a lot of houses in, in city of Grand Rapids that are built on 40-foot lots. What's, what's wrong with a 40-foot lot? Um, so those are the things we have to come back and readdress to make it. Otherwise, in the future, we're all going to be living, um, you know, like 45 minutes away from our destination of, of where we work. Um, if this continues as a trend. So we've, we've got to make what land we have available more usable in terms of density. Yeah, thank you. So Ingrid, I hear you saying agents having personal conversations with their clients. Chris, you talk about local government and those appointed bodies like planning commissions and making some, uh, some nudges there. And Julie, you're talking elected officials. Yeah, I, I, I get it. All of those things can, can go toward making a difference. Um, an important reminder here for our viewers, uh, please do add questions to the chat. Some of you have been doing that already. Jody and, and Scott are monitoring that for me, but Scott has sent one my way, and that is maybe this is a good opportunity to talk about uh, just a couple of things that RPAC may be doing, state, local, federal levels. Can any of you speak to that? Well, we have the uh, chair of the RPAC trustees. <laughs> I really appreciated the question, I tell you that. <laughs> I think may, we might want to indulge our, our moderator to, um, to chime in on this while we're at it. Well, I'll, I'll break rank then for just a moment. Uh, you know, tax, uh, uh, tax policy at a federal level I think is a big one. And I think the more we can all pull together to uh, preserve things like 1031 exchanges, um, but also capital gains tax rates, um, if those go up, we may see investors holding on and riding those out. Uh, which may further compound uh, the inventory issue, not just here, but, but nationwide. So yep. I'll leave it there. Yep, those so. both good issues. Yeah. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, antitrust and colluding issues are from time to time a topic that uh, are brought up or just show up on the Grar Facebook page. Uh, maybe take that by itself, but also talk about how it maybe ties in with the the NAR lawsuit that we, we continue to hear about from time to time. Well, um, shall I give that so one a go to start? Um, well, the GRAR Facebook group is, is always a challenging thing because someone can post something and they're well-intentioned and the original post might be okay on its face, um, but then as we follow some of the comments to the original post, um, it tends to sometimes, again, depending on the topic, um, find its way going downhill rather quickly. Um, Pam and I do not like to delete posts. It's, it's not what we prefer, and we do it only when we really feel we need to. 
Um, but it is a, a slippery slope. You know, in the old days, antitrust and real estate used to be, you had to be careful in a committee meeting at the association office that you didn't, as a group, start talking about something that went down that antitrust path. Well, with social media today, things can erupt so quickly um, without, without warning. And, and part of that, I think, is education and what some of our members understand to be an antitrust issue and why it's a problem. Um, when we start talking about um, boycotting or not using um, a certain third-party website, when we talk about um, and whether we name it by name or not, okay, so in your original post you might say you might not name this third-party website, but I'll guarantee you that in the comments that come, somebody will name it, so it will eventually go down that path again. We have to be so careful talking about the business practices of other brokers, of third-party vendors. We as an association, a lot of people a long time ago said, what are you going to do about XYZ website because you know, now everybody's going to them instead of to us. Well, we as an association can't. The brokers make independent decisions about whether or not they're going to send their listings to third-party websites. If the MLS is sending it to a website that the broker wishes it not be sent to, the broker has control. The broker owns the listings and can shut down that feed to that particular website. We can't get together as a group and talk about um, why we shouldn't be sending our listings to this website or that website, um, or what problems we incur in the process. Um, that's, that's always a danger. Everybody thinks it's only if we talk about our competitor, um, one broker to another. Well, not only are some of these third-party websites getting licensed in many of these states, but you can't, as a group of competitors, collude to boycott a service provider. So regardless of whether they're in a brokerage setting or not, we can't, as a group, decide as a group who we're not going to use or send our listings to any longer. And a lot of members are constantly, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? We aren't going to do anything other than let the brokers make decisions as to where they want their listings to go. Good clarity, Julie. Chris, Ingrid, anything you want to add on what you've experienced out there? The only thing I'm going to say is um, if you're mad and you're in front of your computer, you should just put, put your hands together and stop typing because if that's when everybody makes all these dumb little comments on social media or anything else is when they're angry. Like a seller called and said, you know, all the doors are left open on my house and they let the dog out or whatever. And then they start complaining about that or whatever like that. And then that's when everybody starts commenting and putting negative things about other brokers and all those kind of things. It's like, just hold on, wait a day. You'll calm down by the next day. And um, so when you get mad at a third party website or someone bought this or someone bought that or whatever, just calm down first before you start typing on Facebook about it. So you guys summed it up. Pretty well. I don't think I have too much more to add than that. So. Well, even if third-party brokerage websites aside, even some of, again, the well-intentioned ones where somebody will say, hey, um, has anybody worked with ABC Company? I've not worked with them before. No. Anybody have good experiences mm -hmm. with yeah. them or bad experiences with them? We don't put names of companies and ask what your experience has been unless the only thing you're going to ever say about them is good. We don't do that at our, our Facebook group. We aren't there to bash other companies. If you've got something you want to ask of that nature, start with your office and your broker first. Um, we I don't, can see why people are tempted to do that. Oh, I, I get it. But that's where we have to be yep. careful. Yep. So we should be aware of what boycotting is. We should be aware of what colluding is, and we should avoid both. Uh, but let me use that as a segue to this NAR lawsuit. Uh, mm. NAR is being accused uh, that realtors are colluding in the way that uh, co-op fees uh, pay commissions and the effect it has. Uh, would any of you care to give uh, just a snapshot on, on whether or not we should be concerned with that? Concerned? Um. Well, it could all change at any time, right? So as long as there's freedom in the market and brokers are doing what they want to do, there's really no concern. It is, if, you know, I guess we've been doing this um, the way, you know, you could say a buyer can sell 
a buyer can pay commissions, a seller can pay commissions. It's always negotiable with any client at any time. So um, it's just a matter of, I think there's confusion as far as the lawsuit. I think there's confusion with some sellers and buyers out there of how things get paid for. And I think what it really comes down to is education and maybe some people taking advantage of the situation right now and saying, I maybe can make a whole bunch of money on this or, um, you know, we want to maybe realtors make too much money, so we're we're going to take some of that. Or I don't know what the attitude is of it. Of it, but there's I think there's a I mean everything I've read there's a mi real misunderstanding of how fees are paid, and that we all really do have freedom in everything we're doing on a daily basis to charge whatever we want and to um, the clients to pay or not pay whatever they want. Um, it's to everything's negotiable. Um, to piggyback on that. Um, I, I agree with Chris that part of it is um, the understanding of how you're paid and whether buyers understand that thoroughly. Um, probably at a minimum, I'm guessing one of the things that might come out of this is some sort of a requirement to disclose in a different fashion how you get paid as a buyer's agent. Um, I'm not sure what that will look like, but I wouldn't be surprised at all that, that, that that's modified. Um, I'm also a great believer, sometimes being here a long time is both a blessing and a curse. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, I, and I'm, and I'm not suggesting that I'm taking the lawsuit lightly, but I will tell you for as many years as I've been at GRAR, there have been lawsuits against NAR um, for antitrust issues. Um, they date way back to when there was this um, argument that we were fixing prices. We were all ch charging the same commission. Well, you know, you look at the market today, there's variations on the theme of who gets paid what and how and when and, and whether it's fee-based or commission-based or a minimum or however you get paid. Um, so we've moved from that to what is most current and, and the, the newest thing. And there have been others along the way. As I said, there's variations on the theme. So, um, you know, in, in the years that I've been here, I think I can count on one hand the number of years that NAR hasn't had a pending lawsuit against it for some antitrust issue. Um, I think it's the nature of the beast when you're big industry. And it's not just us. It's, um, you, you name a big industry, you, whether it's um, telecommunications, telecommunications companies, um, yeah, the, even, um, even Facebook, uh, of course, deals with it on a rather routine basis. Um, the bigger you are, the bigger the, the, the target is on your back. So again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to um, minimize what's going on with that lawsuit. Um, do I think something will come of it? Something will probably come of it, yes. Um, I don't know what that will be. Um, but I also don't want to have that get me to the point where um, I'm fearful of how I function. Um, so I think the more you disclose, the more you're transparent about how you're being paid, the better we'll all be in the end. There's some, you know, there's some misunderstandings even with our listing contract where it has the um, sub-agent of seller spaces on there. Uh, I think some people, there's a lot of members out there who are thinking that we're all charging the same thing for listings. We're not. I can tell you. Or not, and they think that because they look at those spaces in there and maybe they're all the same. And all we're saying in there, and it's been wrong all the time, people get it wrong all the time, is what are we offering the buyer's agent if you sell this property? Um, it's not what the total commission is. So um, there's a lot of different commissions being charged, all which is great for the consumer. So um, that's just one, how many times do we say that in our newsletter? Every week, can I can I just give an example so they actually put numbers to yeah, it? So do. so let's suppose, and I'm going to just use some crazy numbers. Um, let's suppose that you're showing a listing and it's offering two and a half percent commission. You might, in your own mind, assume that um, they're charging double of that, uh, and that that's the same. A lot of people assume that the listing office is getting the same thing. That listing office can be charging 15% for all you know and offering you two and a half. And what we'll hear on our end is, hey, that's not fair. You only have a right to know and, an, and a responsibility to know what is being offered to you to, to sell that property. 
what the listing agent and listing broker are earning is frankly none of your business. Um, and I'm not working for the FTC, that's just that. And to piggyback with that, I mean, as a buyer's agent, you have a right to charge your buyer client yep. whatever you want to. Whatever so you're even worth. in your example, you may be collecting two and a half percent. I may be collecting another five percent or whatever the case may be. From your buyer. From the buyer. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to add an interesting, maybe interesting, a wrinkle to where this conversation is headed. If, if at its core, the SNAR lawsuit, uh, the lawsuit against NAR claims that co-op fees and the payment of those via the seller to a buyer's agent is inflating the prices of homes and harming consumers. Can you imagine a day when co-op fees maybe just go away? I think this is absolutely a lesson as to why getting that buyer agency agreement signed before you're writing your first offer with that buyer. You need to get it signed sooner than that. Um, I'm a great believer that maybe not in my tenure or lifetime, but there will come a day where if you're working for the seller, you get paid by the seller. If you were working for the buyer, you get paid by the buyer. Now that doesn't prohibit a buyer from asking in the agreement, in their offer, for the seller to pay some form of their closing costs, which may include their buyer broker's fees. So it's not as if they have to come up with that extra cash. But I think you better start functioning as if that buyer, look to that buyer for responsibility of payment. Um, I suspect that they will come. Again, maybe not in my lifetime, but um, I think it will come. And I think some of what's happening with this lawsuit will generate that conversation. So there'll still be a fee out there. It's yeah. just a matter. And the seller still may be paying it. Right. It just might be worded differently. Mm -hmm. Really, when everything you just said it says we can word it any way we want um, and still have the seller paying or the buyer paying, it's, it's anything's available. As long as there's value that we provide, yes, there will still be uh, that resource there. Okay. I want to move on to uh, another relatively new development. Uh, the clear cooperation policy uh, was handed down by uh, NARS voting delegates to, uh, to all of us across the country, and that was last May, I think, kind of right in the, the middle, yep. of the, middle of the pandemic. But um, so we see, even with that, we see agents uh, advertising and discussing off-market sales, upcoming listings, things like that on a regular basis through social media and other means. Uh, can you explain the rule? Can any of you explain the rule in, in detail and then address how it is applying and maybe how it ought to apply more to our to our current business. You want to read the rule? Oh, I don't have, have the, well, I don't have the exact rule. Oh, well, I can, yeah, I can read it's it. It's pretty short. It is pretty short. Okay, so let me uh, pick it out here. Listings shall be filed with the MLS as follows based on whichever occurs first. Within three days after the listing is obtained, Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays accepted, provided no marketing is occurring or within one day from the date that marketing begins. Some might say, what does marketing mean? Let me further define what marketing means. Marketing for um, purposes of anything to do with that listing means that there's no marketing permitted by the listing agent or broker to any person, including other licensees in the brokerage firm. So it's information for your ears and perhaps your broker only, because that's who you work for, but you don't promote it amongst your own office or that's considered marketing. And that's, a, that's been misunderstood, I think, by a lot of members. But that is the current clear cooperation policy required by NAR to be adopted by all local realtor associations. Nice, so we we nice can't not done. do that? So we have to do that? Yeah, yeah we do. Let, <laughs> let, me ask, let me ask the next question this way. Uh, for each of you, how have you viewed the impact of the clear cooperation policy so far? I personally support the. I think it's a great policy. I think it's great for the um, the the public. I mean, we it, it's it helps avoid maybe fair housing issues. So if we didn't, for example, if we didn't have the clear cooperation policy, and I'm a brokerage and I started, you know, promoting it within you know some of my my friends and family and what have you, well, then there's a whole segment of the market 
that is not getting access to that listing. So I think it's, I think it's very beneficial for, for the public that everybody gets a fair shot at it. It is dispersed to uh, the broadest pool of buyers. Um, so not only good for potential buyers, but also for sellers. Um, I mean, don't you want your listing to be promoted to the biggest pool of buyers out there? So I, I think it's, um, you know, and, and it's frustrating when, you know, in the past I've tried to look up a listing and, and it's not there. And, you, you, you know, I look like an idiot in front of my clients like, well, I can't find it. I don't know. Let me see. Um, and then trying to track that down. So I, um, I think it's good for our industry as a whole. Chris, have you seen any negative impacts of it so far? Well, negative. I, I totally agree with what it is. Um, I think not, if we didn't have it, it's, there's, there's some people that are still putting out there like a Facebook post that says, I have a listing coming, it's on Monday, I have a listing coming on Friday. Well, there's still, you know, I mean, putting the address or anything on there, but you're still advertising a listing. And to contact you about that listing. So when they contact you, are you telling them where this house is and all those kind of things? Well, you should be putting it on, um, you shouldn't be doing that. Um, in my opinion, and I can be controversial in saying that, and maybe someone will ask a question and disagree with me. But um, <laughs> when it really comes down to it, I think um, there's a lot of stuff people not doing this. So in that, I think it, the negative part about it is it's unfair. Um, for the people following the rules, it's unfair um, to the other agents who are following the rules. Because uh, I think the only, there might be other reasons, but the biggest reasons why agents are doing that is to either get their own buyer or get their own client to raise their commission or whatever it is. To, so it's a monetary thing for them to be able to, um, or in this market, is it so that their buyers can get a first chance at it, mm -hmm. where um, they may not, they have to compete with everybody else. In this market, I can see that as a um, reason why people would want to do that too. So yeah. that's a glimpse of, at some of the cause for it. Julie, can you maybe offer just a little more history about you know, what, what led up to Clear Cooperation's emergence? Um, really, quite frankly, it's, a, it's as Chris indicated. It, um, it started um, to a certain state west of us where um, mm -hmm. many of the brokerage firms were advertising only internally and not placing listings on the MLS and selling things in office. Um, and it became really the way of life, and, and it became, as you said, um, a fair and open housing issue in that area. Ultimately, that one of the associations in that area uh, created a rule and then sent it forward to the National Association and said, you know what, um, we're getting kickback from our members. Is this, is this okay? Is this not okay? And it went so far as to have it considered by NAR because NAR was hearing from many associations about that same problem. Um, we, we hear about it. Pam and I spend a, a lot of time uh, fielding these types of calls and questions. I mean, if you see a sign and you're, uh, and you're watching for that to hit the MLS and it doesn't hit within 24 hours, we, of course, are going to encourage you to either reach out to that agent or that broker. Um, you can also, if you wish, um, notify us. We will reach out to that agent. It's likely you're not the only one that has asked about it. Um, we'll reach out and we'll find out what the status of that property is and um, we will communicate that with you and or help educate the person who wasn't aware that the sign meant 24 hours. Um, we, hear, we hear a lot of, and for everybody that's listening to this now or later, um, you're all going to have an exception to the rule, okay? I grant you, you all have exceptions to the rule. The seller's wife is pregnant and she's nine months and she's a week overdue and they don't want that many showings. I'm gonna tell you every exception in the book. I've heard them all. Um, unfortunately, everybody's trying to make an exception the rule and that's not how it works and that's not where, how most sellers would like their property to be distributed or marketed or made available to others. So um, if you, um, the other thing, the other problem we've seen is the timing of when the sign is installed. A lot of people will say, well, I didn't realize that the sign installer went out um, then and, and did it that day. It was supposed to be on that day, so I wasn't aware. Um, and that was, that was all good and reasonable um, explanations during the transition, but we're beyond that now. So we all should have proper 
um, procedures in place to be able to know when that sign goes in the ground so that you're not marketing it prior to that time. So um, that's... Go ahead, Ingrid. Oh, I was going to say, you know, Julie, you, you know, there's always kind of exceptions. I think this association has done a great job with providing tools to agents as to, I mean, we've got that addendum that says, okay, we, we get the seller's signature. Okay, we're not going to allow showings for three days or whatever the case may be. I mean, as long as we are all treating each other equally, I'm not giving you preferential treatment because you're in my brokerage and not you, um, you know, we can work around a lot of those exceptions the right way. Right. Delay of submission. So let me just put on my contrarian hat one more time and say. He loves to do this. Is, is, Did anybody ever tell you he grew up as a kid across and, and his dad was making them debate each other at the supper table? <laughs> if, if I, you know, you talk about these exceptions and, and you know, I, maybe some are, are fabricated, but many are real. And for an agent who says, hey, um, this really isn't the best interest of my seller. I know what's in the best interest of my seller. Why can't I do this the way that I want to do it? How do you answer that? There are certainly exceptions to the rule. Um, the key is what has the seller consented to and have they consented based on full knowledge and impact of that decision. So we'll use my example, the pregnant woman who's a week overdue and heaven forbid they'd be thinking about listing their house now anyway. But um, mm -hmm. So if that's the time at which they're listing their home, sure, you're going to probably have that conversation. Do you want, especially if it's in that sweetheart price range, um, do you want uh, showings every 15 minutes for the next three days so you're essentially out of here? Um, and if not, Maybe you work out something else with, with them that's an office exclusive. I don't, I don't know the answer to that necessarily, but each exception is probably going to have a different answer and a, and a different application as to what is best for that seller. So, um, yeah, I, I don't disagree that there will be exceptions to the rule, but I, I always hear the exceptions to the rule, and I'm, there's just not that many exceptions. There's just not. You know, I kind of always go back to why do we have the multi-listing service? Right. Well, if nobody follows, if we have a multi-listing service and nobody follows these rules, or they keep, you know, not listing, you know, doing it, I have a buyer for this one, so, you know, I'm just going to do that. They don't need the multi-listing service, right? But you want every other agent to do that to your buyers? Um, the whole purpose we have this multi-listing service is so that we have the cooperation of all agents. And if we stop that and just do these little side deals and these little exceptions and everything, we lose that. And um, I it might work in this market, mm -hmm. but well, long term, we went, we want to preserve that because it's right. one of the best assets we have to working together. I mean, how, say we didn't have that, are we gonna? Ingrid wants to show, calls me up, she wants to show my listing. Mm -hmm. She, I have no agreement to compensate her for that. Right. Well, right? I might not even find your listing. Right? <laughs> oh, uh, it'll be on my website. You can find it there. But, uh, so anyways, there's an all 3, but there's other so websites. many things that the MLS um, provides us in this part of its cooperation. And if we lose that cooperation, we've lost everything. Um, and, and Chris, I've heard you speak on this often enough before to know that when you say that with that kind of passion, it's not a self-preservation kind of a statement. It's one of the ways that we best provide value to our to sellers the, to, and our buyers, whole, yes, because right? mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a great system we have, and whoever invented it was a really smart person, but um, I don't know how it, I have the you got the history, yes, <laughs> and I, it's so interesting to see, I mean, we've been doing this a long time, that was formed a long time ago, and how important that is, and I, we take it for granted every day, I think, as agents, and I just wanted to say, remind you guys how important that is, and to preserve it, and the only way to preserve it is to play within the rules. I don't know if there's a better uh, big picture note maybe to uh, ask for some last thoughts, but we are uh, uh, up against time. And so let me just ask, uh, any last thoughts that any of you would like to share? You know, I, I would just say, you know, hey, it is, it is a challenging market. It's, we've been in challenging markets before. It's not a balanced market right now. And I would say let's, you know, just keep it professional. Let's really act in that spirit of cooperation and gee whose theme is that 
and the spirit of cooperation. Follow, yes, that you. <laughs> and um, you know, let's remember the golden rule. Let's remember the preamble to our code of ethics that says, "Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you." So, here, here. And that really solves all of our problems, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, everything we've talked about today would be solved by that. So. <laughs> Okay, with that, thank you, Ingrid. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Chris. Thanks to all of you for tuning in today, and um, we'll sign off. Have a great day, everybody.